Hi everyone, you are joining us on Facebook Live here at Symposium 2018. It's our first day of Symposium and we are so happy to be joined by Daphna Lender who presented today for us for a Thursday workshop. Um, Daphna is from the Fairplay Institute just outside of Chicago. Daphna, tell us a little bit about what you do at the Fairplay Institute. Okay, I'm the program director and I occupy my time thinking up of great trainings for people who work with parents and children, um, trainings that will impact the relationship. Our um, intervention is all about improving the, the parent-child relationship. And we travel all over the world to work with lots of different um, people in lots of different uh, countries. And it's, it's fascinating work because a lot of it is nonverbal, and so it doesn't matter if we don't speak Japanese or Latvian or Danish. Um, it's this universal nonverbal aspect of communication that's founded in it's foundationally in um, found in the way parents relate to their infants, and then we translate that up all the way through the generations to 103. Wow! And how mm -hmm. important is that nonverbal component? Well, okay. So today I spoke about the social engagement system, which is an aspect of the polyvagal theory that Steve Porges. Uh, created and theorizes that um, the social engagement system reads our nonverbal expressions to discern whether or not a person is trusting, trustworthy, is uh, somebody who you can feel safe with, and if so, do I want to connect with that person? And it happens in 300 milliseconds, so less than a se less than a half a second. And our brain is, is trained to decipher those safety signals and then determine whether to back away or to act very closed off and defensive or to act receptive and to engage and connect. So those things are learned in infancy through about the first two, two to three years. And if babies got those mixed signals non-verbally or they, got, um, they were misattuned with, it sets a pattern for the rest of their lives if they don't get intervention, or if they don't have a healing um, relationship. Um, and so it's extremely important because in your adult relationships, if you think that things are going well, but on a deeper level, you have a hard time really trusting and connecting, it has to do with your brain sort of perceiving the other person as not um, that not trustworthy or not trustworthy a hundred percent so you have to hold back uh, but you don't know why so it's non-conscious so this sounds like a very elemental issue for therapy yeah okay. really elemental and are therapists able to sort of improve their relationships with their clients if they can master a little bit more of this engagement process yeah they can this is something that can be learned it does have a lot to do with knowing yourself and being very in tune with your own body and being integrated and working on your own stuff. So it's not just behaviors. However, one can learn how to sit and how to talk, the kind of posture, um, the kind of the voice prosody, which is how you, um, that, that just all the sounds and the um, pauses and the emphases that you put on in a, any sentence that it's not the words it's the way you're saying it so um, there's a part of the brain that registers up and down tonality and it helps the brain to trust the person if they have tonality and changes as opposed to a monotonous voice that has kind of a unidirectional um, tone to it and the, um, the, 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 the way that you talk in usually brains like to hear things in nuggets of information so it's good to have natural pauses and then you know, the next fra uh, f phrase is somewhat complementary kind of the same length as the first phrase it makes the brain understand what you're saying mm -hmm. so it's really it's almost like music so if you're talking to a child it's something like first we're going to go to grandma's house and pick up your brother then we're going to go to karate class um, across town, and then we're going to go get ice cream. So those three components, I made them very blatant that they're um, 
three steps of a process, but when you're trying to explain something, even to adults, it's really helpful to not run on in sentence and to have these pauses and these um, emphases and so on. Um, those are the kind of things that you can totally learn. Singers have to learn it. Um, speech pathologists have to learn it. Poets know it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can totally learn it. You did a hugely popular article for us about micro behaviors mm -hmm. and the way to sort of be able to engage the social engagement system. Mm -hmm. Given a couple of them to us right here. Mm -hmm. Any anything else? Anything you can show us? Any other micro behaviors that therapists need to know about? Mm, well, I did. I was pretty comprehensive in that <laughs> article, but I mean, in live, I can you know I can show the idea of open and curious eyes okay. having to do with setting um, as much of your forehead back that you can um, kind of relieve the lines and make an open, yeah, an open expression by, by raising the eyebrows, opening, there you go. Um, and also people naturally set their ears back when they smile. Um, and those who can wiggle their ears have um, uh, ability then to kind of magn manufacture this even more open face. Uh -huh. But it helps a person who's a little wary and thinking, are you actually curious or maybe you're, um, maybe you think you have malicious thoughts towards me or, you know, I'm suspicious of you and we're both suspicious, suspicious of each other. Yeah. It's, it helps to open up the, the forehead and to be... Um, kind of, you can also tell I'm doing it with my, with my chest, my shoulders. I'm kind of like opening your neck a little bit to show I'm vulnerable to you uh -huh. is really helpful with a, parent, a client who's defensive. Okay. Okay. And those, and this crosses age groups. So this is good for kids and good for adults. It's good for the same kind of micro behaviors with across the generation. Yeah. I mean, you have to do it probably a little bit more subtly with adults. For example, the melodic voice. Some older people find that somewhat condescending okay. um, because yeah. it can be, it just sounds a little bit like you're talking to them like a child. Yeah. So you would tone down, you would tone that down and the range wouldn't be as high, but you would still have, you would still need to have those kind of um, moments of, you know, drama or excitement in your voice to make it so that the person really n n can feel you and understand you. And, um, but with kids, you can be a lot more dramatic. Yeah. Um, Anybody who's watching who has any questions for Daphna, feel free to key them in on Facebook and we'll take a look and ask um, if you get in touch with us in the next minute or so. Um, let's see. Now, reassuring touch is something else that you've been talking mm -hmm. about. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the importance of that and why for some therapists touch can still be problematic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think part of it is really societal. Okay. Um, I think part of it is that we have, in, and, and it's clearly something to respect with people who have been traumatized and who have um, issues with boundaries and they could easily become hurt from um, inappropriate touch or misattuned touch. Mm -hmm. Even with that, um, that um, I guess, uh, caution, it's important to be able to incorporate touch in therapy because we have a body and the body responds so powerfully to touch in terms of regulation and calming and it seems like it's a shame to not be able to provide an aspect of that if it's possible and when it's possible and when it's appropriate. And it can start with a simple handshake at the door mm -hmm. or a consolidating, I say a consolidating handshake at the end, which is, if I may show you, it's just putting your hand and, and putting, you know, your two hands and clasping it and saying, you know, I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the pressure that I'm putting on your hand and you could feel it is meant to surround your yeah, hand yeah. and to leave an impression. Yeah. And with the eye contact, like, let's carry this together, you know, to the next time. Like, I'll remember you. Mm -hmm. um, other aspects are simply like sitting closer to a person. There's varying distances that therapists uh, use for sitting face to face. Some people sit, some therapists sit close. Some sit all the way across the room. Mm -hmm. um, this is, as I'm seeing it, pretty average. And to me, this is very far Really? Because what I'd like to be able to do, if it's okay with the client, is be able to lean in 
is to be able to, and I could check with them to see if that's just if this distance is okay. Verbally checking. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I could um, I could then imagine being able to. Um, um, it wouldn't be such a dramatic uh, gesture if I was then able to put my hand on your shoulder because let's say you're upset or you're dissociating and I'm here and I'm saying, I'm here, I'm here with you, which is, you know, this is, it would really depend on um, this, the, the felt sense of safety within the relationships. Yeah. I would not just go and, you know, touch a person um, willy nilly, but there's something very encompassing and safe you know, creating safety, just like you would with a baby who's scared, mm -hmm. um, it can really calm a person. Mm -hmm. And it, it shouldn't be out of the realm of possibility in the right moment to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Easier uh, with children to get that permission than it is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they're already going to, you know, they're sitting on you, you know, before yeah. you're even able to do anything. They're yeah. already, and, and they, they, they're already, you know, jumping in, on you and, and, um, jumping around and so you have to hold their hands and you have to um, we do a lot of things like we do things like swinging and rocking and jumping and piling things on like if they lay down on the floor and we pile a um, pillows to make them into like a, a pizza where we put toppings and it gives them a lot of firm pressure okay. for those children who don't like direct touch it's still kind of gives that like wrapping and casing mm -hmm. um, sinking feeling that calms the uh, the nervous system and for adults what we would offer is like the couch needs to be really inviting with lots of different fabric um, blankets pillows and even like weighted things like a weighted blanket uh -huh. or a weighted teddy bear yeah um, because people really want something to hold and protect them okay. Yeah. yeah. Even for adults. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's really, um, when they, when you feel vulnerable, you want to be protected. Okay. So you can, you know, drape something around your shoulders yeah. or hide behind a pillow yeah. and settle into the, to the ground. I even like to have like little, uh, footstools because you, I do encourage my clients if they want to, to take their shoes off because, um, I want them to be really comfortable, like to feel at home. But also, if depending on if they're short, <laughs> you know, kids are they want they need something grounding on their feet. Ah, so dangling feet is is work. no good. I have a question mm -hmm. here. Um, who are some popular figures that demonstrate effective communication micro behaviors? And second part, do you think they learn them naturally or study them to figure them out? Oh my goodness! <clears throat> that comes to mind. What comes to mind, excuse me for pining, is Esther Perel, who we're all going to meet tomorrow, who is the master in, 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 in voice prosody. She's a natural storyteller. Uh, she really captures rhythm and poetry and resonance. Um, she touches. She gets close. She does it naturally, I think. I really think that it's a... Um, inherent part of who she is uh you know i i would love to ask her and i think um people will see tomorrow what i'm talking about because it comes completely natural to her the other person is barack obama um i think that there is this issue this question of charisma like what is charisma mm -hmm. and whether you agree with him politically or not he's a very charismatic person and one of his greatest skills is oratory mm -hmm. because he really makes you feel like he's part of the story, that he cares, okay? And they're, they're, they're little touches, but they, they make it so that he affects the audience. And part of it is the way he uses his hand and his hand gestures, but part of it is how he repeats certain sentences and he's almost like a preacher, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and a good storyteller. I don't know whether he learned it or whether it's natural. My inclination is to say that it that there's more of a natural aspect to it, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn it. You, everybody can learn it. So both of these people that you're talking about grew up in other countries, or partly in mm -hmm. other countries. Mm -hmm. Does this play a part? 
understand the ability to access touch? Touch? Or, or, or these micro behaviors as well. Okay, because touch definitely yeah. is totally a cultural um, phenomenon. And um, it's incredible how different the attitudes are towards touch in different countries that I've been to. Um, now, as far as the micro behaviors, that's a very interesting question. I don't know if I know the answer. I think being an outsider helps to be a really good observer. Um, when you're an outsider, you have to kind of figure out the lay of the land and figure out the territory and be like, I want to copy them because I don't want to stand out and stuff like that. So you, I mean, being good at observing and mimicry and things has to do with, you know, being able to communicate um, in the native language. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps there's something to it. I, I'm from Israel. Mm -hmm. I came here when I was six, but um, I definitely feel like I'm studying, you know, like a little cultural anthropologist and studying the way people talk and behave in their facial expressions and body gestures all over the country, like from Minnesota, you know, to Alabama, to Albuquerque. Like, it's really interesting that there are certain things, there are certain things that are different. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the outsider perspective. Right. So one last question before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining the parents coming into TheraPlay, you're working with their kids in this way, and you're having to encourage the parents to maybe also change some micro behaviors and some touch behaviors. How does that go? Wow. There's a variety of reactions. I think parents uh, want to do whatever it takes. I think they often feel blamed. And if I can get through the feeling of defensiveness, and get them to really believe and trust me that I'm totally on their side, they're willing to do just about anything. Mm -hmm. And But that's usually the major barrier is they feel like, you don't understand me, you don't understand where I come from, and so you can't tell me what to do or I'm not going to become vulnerable because I've been hurt. Mm -hmm. So I see the parents um, as clients as much as I see the, the child as a client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Daphne. This has been so interesting, such an essential part of our work that we need to learn more about. Thank you for sharing it with us today. You're welcome. It's and been my you, pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for checking in with us on Facebook.